Welcome to episode 430 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger at sellingyourscreenplay.com. Today I am interviewing writer-director Hamza Zaman, who just wrote and directed the new thriller feature film called The Institute. We talk about his career and how this film came together. Like so many filmmakers I talk to on the podcast, he did a bunch of short films which helped him get to this point, so we talk a little bit about that as well. And then as the interview ends, Hamza actually asks me a bunch of questions about my career, So there's about 10 extra minutes at the end of the interview where he asked me um, just a bunch of sort of questions about my films and and how I was able to sell some scripts and and get some of my films produced. I decided to leave it in because I thought it might be interesting to some folks. Um, It kind of was a different angle. Obviously, I talk a lot on my own podcast, um, but it was sort of refreshing to get some questions from someone that kind of was coming at it from a different angle. So anyway, if you're interested in that, definitely keep your podcast player running until the end. So stay tuned for that interview. SYS's Six Figure Screenplay Contest is open for submissions. Just go to www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash contest. Our regular deadline is May 31st. If your script is ready, definitely submit now to save some money. We're looking for low budget shorts and features. I'm defining low budget as less than six figures. In other words, less than one million US dollars. We've got lots of industry judges reading scripts in the later rounds, giving away thousands in cash and prizes, and some additional prize even from writer duet, some writer software will come to the winner as well. This year we have a short film script category, 30 pages or less. So if you have a low budget short script, by all means submit that as well. I've got a number of industry judge producers looking for short scripts too. If you want to submit to the contest or learn more about it, you can also see all the judges. I list them on the contest page as well. Just go to www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash contest. Also this year we're running an in-person film festival in tandem with our screenplay contest. It's for low budget films produced for less than 1 million US dollars. We have a feature and shorts category and lots of industry judges just like the screenplay contest. The festival is going to take place in Hollywood, California from October 7th to October 9th. If you've produced a short film or know someone who has, by all means, please do submit it. Obviously, features are more than welcome as well. But shorts are very easy to program, fit them into the contest. I can run two or three shorts before a feature film um, and and do I can run a whole section. I could just block off an hour or two um, just to run shorts and um, get a lot of films through the process. So I'm definitely going to be accepting a lot more shorts into the festival than features, obviously, just because they're easier to program and and we can show them all. So I'm really encouraging shorts to submit, but obviously features as well. Um, We really want to highlight the features that um, some really cool features that have been done on a low budget as well. So if you know a filmmaker or you're a filmmaker yourself, definitely um, check it out. we are listed on Film Freeway, so you actually have to submit through that. You can go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash festival, and then um, you'll see the whole the description of the festival, and then um, there'll be a link to Film Freeway. And if you're already on Film Free, I'm sure if you have a, a finished film and you're submitting to um, film festivals, you're already on Film Freeway. So you can find us there as well. Um, again, it's just SYS's six-figure film festival and screenplay contest on Film Freeway. But you can go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash festival and just click over. If this episode, if you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking or sharing it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. And I know I come on and I say this exact same message every week, um, but I do notice just people liking them and and sharing them, and um, it really is helpful. So to everyone who has liked and shared some of my posts in the past, I really do appreciate it and thank you. Any websites or links that I mention in the podcast can be found on my blog and the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast. And then just look for episode number 430. So now let's get into the main segment. Today I am interviewing writer, director Hamza Zamim, and as mentioned, there is a 10-minute bonus at the end where he starts asking me some questions. So if you'd like to hear that, just keep your podcast player running. Here is the interview. Welcome, Hamza, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Thank you. It's good to be here, Ashley. Thanks for having me on. Sure thing. So to start out, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up and how did you get interested in the entertainment business? Well, um, I was born in New York, in Queens, but I've lived all over, you know, like the Midwest, the Far East, um, you know, and then back to New York for, you know, high school and, and so on, and then Massachusetts for school. And I guess my initial interest in, I guess if I really want to go to the root, 
It was like Saturday morning cartoons, watching them and then being like, I want this story to happen a little differently. Hmm. And from there, it kind of evolved. I think my first screenplay, my mom found this old folder of mine that I have now, um, which was like from 14, 15, 16, you know, so basically high school, I started writing what I considered like scripts, but they were just handwritten, mm-hmm. not in format. You know, the, the, they were sort of descriptive. They sort of muddled like the dialogue and the action and all the stuff together. And they were, um, <laughs> you know, they're, they're teenage yeah. scripts, you know, like yep, some, yep. some point of life. I read some to my wife and she was laughing about it because they are, you know, you can tell they're written by like a 14, 15 year old, mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, you know, I was really happy to see them. And I think I had like two or three, in that one package, I haven't actually had a chance to go and read them all, but that's kind of the initial inception, the seed, I think. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Of, you know, yeah. So then, so then you're writing these things in high school. Were you also just like shooting them with your friends on whatever camera no, you could no. put together? I didn't. I I had some friends in the drama department. You know, it, we didn't really have the equipment. You know, back then, mm-hmm. um, not the editing. We didn't really know what to do. You know, I had one yeah. idea. We got the close to one idea. It was called like. I remember this because, you know, two of my high school friends, um, one of them actually who's in entertainment now and, you know, sort of does props and things. So he kind of made it uh, it's sort of um, and the other one, you know, sadly passed. But uh, it was about a horror movie. And then they basically we wrote it out. I, I got everybody together. You know, I'm, I was always very like organized. Like we're going to make this happen. And then one of my friends said, hey, this sounds a little bit too much like this other movie. And I'm like, but it's not. And then we, I basically just left it, dropped it. You know, mm-hmm. I couldn't really collaborate with them. It happened recently, too. I tried to write with someone and get their like they had like a real biopic kind of like uh pitch and i was like okay let's sit down and do the work and they kind of were like sort of not as regimented about mm-hmm. it and i'm like just this is not like <laughs> this is not just like bsing i mean you know to, as you know ashley mm-hmm. as a writer you know you have to sit down and do the work and write so yeah it's hard to collaborate yeah, and it's it's not always easy work. Um, so then take us through that step. So then you're out of high school. Um, how did you actually push this in? I noticed on IMDb you have a number of short films that I mean you have a lot of acting credits, so we can talk a little bit about that, but you have a number of short films that you wrote and directed sure. as well. So maybe just take us through that gap. Did you start acting first and then started to move into writing and directing, or was it the other well, way around? So you know, that kind of ended. I I had my stuff, it was like very experimental pieces, college. After college, you know, I still wrote a little bit, took some classes, but nothing really serious. And then um, after I started working and kind of like building my career, I just one day, you know, got like, you know, I was always into it. I'm always still working on my stories on the side, trying to write like comic concepts. And, you know, it's just really outside the industry. And I didn't really do it the right way or really push it hard, but I kept that passion. Mm -hmm. And so one day I just said, I'm just going to make a movie. So I put like 10 grand together, made a short. This was like 2008. So it was a while ago. And um, and I just did this movie for like, uh, you know, kind of like what bothered me. You know, it's very political, very like short lived. Um, I don't think you can even find it anywhere. It was like, you know, 2008. So it was on one contest, I think I like fifth or sixth. And then I just dropped it and, you know, kind of went about my day still working on the writing, still just, you know, kind of building up this sort of menagerie of ideas. I think I showed my wife what I have, like in my final draft folder. It's about 75 or 80 different like treatment scripts you know mm-hmm. pilots everything you know these are just these are just separate ideas some of the ideas you know like what i take mm-hmm. into production is there's a screenplay there's an outline there's a, you know there's shooting script and then you know like some other assorted things related to it so mm-hmm. there's just a lot of baggage if you will or just you know resources so i just started making them i just kind of actually was with my wife you know we were just like hey I, the first one I kind of like got back into it. I start. I actually was doing background on a friend of mine's short. I, for a whim, I put up a link on, you know, put up my picture on IMDb. So uh, somebody from the West Coast called me and she's like, hey, do you have a West Coast rep? And I was like at lunch with my friend. And I remember I was like, well, not on the West Coast yet. <laughs> <laughs> and that was kind of my journey into more professional performance where I, you know, I've had a couple of dozen kind of actor credits. Mm-hmm. And for the writing, it was just that's my, you know, that's my my real passion. So Mm -hmm. it's always been like, okay, how are they doing this? What's the story about, you know, kind of staying in there. And then roughly the same time I said, I'm just going to start making my own, you know? So my, my girlfriend at the time, uh, my wife now, you know, my producing partner, she was very, very supportive, which was one of the first partners I've ever had. That was actually very supportive of this. The rest were kind of like, you know, get to work, you know, let's, Mm -hmm. let's, let's make sure that you have a, you know, a real kind of uh, stable, 
grip on the societal ladder, mm -hmm. but she was very open to it. You know, she's worked on Broadway for many years, a real creative type. Mm -hmm. So we made our first short Vimana, you know, it got a few little awards, you know, got a bunch of traffic. It was very poetic, not, you know, I wrote a poem basically and I sent it to like a few of my friends and they were like, okay, let's make this. So I'm like, oh, okay, cool. There's no dialogue. It's all just image huh. just right? Mm -hmm. And then from there, we just started writing bigger and bigger. You know, I just started writing bigger and bigger projects mostly around things that bother me, you know, uh, sickness was in 2018, believe it or not. And very looking back on it, very prophetic towards COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, the tribe was done after that. And it's kind of about like the breakdown in society. So, you know, these are just things that kind of like, you know, probably the same as you when you write this stuff, you know, it just kind of mm -hmm. like bothers you. And I've, you know, had about half a dozen plays produced too, which was kind of roughly around the same time. I wrote like a short, short play, like a one act, I got into this one play contest in New York, uh, won that little contest. And then we found some producers to expand it to a full length. They went to the fringe, um, you know, and, you know, sold out the premiere and then you kind of start on those routes. So those are a little more political. My, my theater work is, you know, really kind of, it's more, you know, dialogue heavy, obviously, yeah. and more you know, about kind of the real societal axes I have to grind the film. I try to always keep entertaining and, you know, fun, even though I'm, I'm sure my own personal perspective can't help but come through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So let's dig into your latest feature film, The Institute, sure, um, sure. and kind of talk about that a little bit. Um, maybe you can give us a quick picture logline. What is this film all about? The story is basically a young couple that's unable to conceive um, goes to a charismatic doctor's remote facility for treatment. And, you know, the treatment starts to be a little bit more unorthodox and they, um, you know, start to wonder about what exactly mm -hmm. is going on. Gotcha. And where did this idea come from? Where was, what was sort of the genesis of this story? Um, well, it's a few, I guess, you know, a lot of my work deals with like a power imbalance, right? So I don't want to get, uh, it's really not very like a political film. It's a very, you know, <laughs> enjoyable, fun to watch kind of popcorn mm -hmm. film. Um, but, you know, there's a certain inherent power imbalance, in, especially in like reproduction. And, and it's hard for us as men to really, you know, comment on it you know it's really not our place to talk about it but you know i've had you know my wife as we we had our first and then second child we realized that you know there really is no control you know of a, of a female body especially when it comes to this and we've had a few of our other friends you know who had some fertility issues actually somebody in my family and we realize you know how much pressure society puts on a woman how desperate it makes them um and so it's a it's kind of a taboo subject you know sort of touchy and i mm -hmm. wanted to handle it with you know, delicacy, but I also felt it was a very powerful and compelling story that maybe hadn't really been done before. You know, that's my other thing. I want to do something that hasn't quite been, you know, ever approached. Otherwise, you know, why are you going to regurgitate that? So yeah. that's kind of the, the genesis of it. And also me having a child and, you know, when we decided we we're going to have a child and that kind of pressure, you know, it was like a good kind of stew of like, okay, what's going on here? You know, there's pressure on the male as well, but I don't think anywhere near as much on the male. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about your writing process a little bit. I always just like to kind of get different perspectives on how people write. Um, where do you typically write? Do you have a home office? Do you go to Starbucks? Do you need that ambient new, new noise? Do you write in the morning, middle of the night? What does your writing schedule look like when you get into a groove? At this point, I mean, it's gone through the gamut, right? Over the years. At one point I was writing like full-time, you know, which would be the ideal. I wake up at like, you know, six, seven, eight, write as my day job until, you know, I go to dinner right before I go to bed, you know, I was cranking out a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff at that point. Mm -hmm. At this point, you know, it's basically writing at night. So I have about two hours a day. I can write at night. I kind of like feel that liminal sort of sleep stage. It kind of gives me some ideas. I'm always like you know, carrying my notebook around with me and, and, you know, jotting down ideas, but mm -hmm. that's kind of the time, the quiet time I have once the kids are sort of bed and, you know, I can sort of work on, although lately I haven't had a chance to, to write that much because of the production schedule, because of the promotion schedule, delivery, QC, all this stuff, you know, it's my first film. So you've done it a few times. So it's a little bit more, you know, in hand for you, but this was all like a, a real steep learning yeah. curve. Yeah. Yeah. No, it doesn't get any easier, all the deliverables and just trying to do the marketing. Yeah. As I mentioned to you, we have our ride share killer coming out and really there's no end to how much marketing you can do. You can always find more ways to market, yeah. reach out to more can people, you. try and set up more interviews or just do more marketing. So it is, it's a, it's a, 
a challenging process. So um, let's talk about again with the Institute, how does it come down in terms of actually writing script pages versus outlining? Um, it sounds like you're carrying around this notebook coming up with ideas, but what does that actually look like for you? Um, do you spend three, four, five, six months just outlining? Do you spend a month outlining, a month writing? What does it look like for you in terms of outlining versus actually in final draft cranking out script pages? Yeah, that's a good question. I, um, you know, to be honest, I haven't really, I'm more a farmer than an architect, right? So it's, I get the idea. It, it, it's kind of like gestates in there. I can kind of, I sort of dream about it a little bit. I think about it, you know, I kind of see the general outlines and then I just start getting to work, man. You know, I'm like one of these guys, I like literally can work on a computer or I can work on a typewriter because I will put that first page in and just start writing out the story. I have sometimes a little notebook with some outlines on the side or, you know, like a lot of times, of course, the beginnings and the endings are the easiest things to write, right? Mm -hmm. So it's that kind of the middle area where you want to really build your structure and kind of, you know, focus your time on, on increasing the, the believability and the quality and, you know, the surprise. But I'll have those kind of on the side. But I like to really, once in a while, I'll come up with a scene in the middle. But I would say I'm, I'm, like, a, I'm like a rocket, you know, you like the fuse. I want the story. I want to live the story from the beginning all the way through. And I kind of like to surprise myself sometimes, you know, like if there's a particular, I like to paint my characters into a corner and then just kind of like think about it and, and be like, okay, well, I've done really pushed this, the situation to the maximum. Mm -hmm. Where can I go from here? And that's where I find the real breakthroughs and the challenge and the fun is for me, you know, yeah. of course, then there's like the 10 other drafts. Like I think we had 11, I call it 10.3. So I guess there's 13 drafts mm -hmm. or before we actually the, you know, did the live shooting, but the last few were just kind of like little changes, you know, so I call yeah. it 10.3. So 10 main drafts. Huh. That's, that's an interesting um, metaphor, a farmer, not an architect. Um, Cause I find myself more of an architect than a farmer, but I hate doing the rewrites and I get sort of bogged down with rewrites. So I feel like the more outlining I can do, the less I can sort of head off some of those problems, but it sounds like that's part of your process is actually doing those just a lot of rewrites and a lot of changes. Yeah. I mean, I've started doing some more TV stuff and, you know, I've gone through a couple of programs where, you know, it's more like the the structure is so key, especially with TV, right? Long format writing, right? Instead of writing like 200 pages or 120 pages for like a, a movie, talk about writing 400, 500, 600 pages for like a season, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's not, you know, something that usually people do alone, but it's, it's, you know, kind of a different way of thinking about a story about characters. How would you pull this out for a season, two season, three season, four season, infinity? So I've started to do that, but it's a different kind of mindset. Those stories are, you know, like the way you write a feature is, you know, more self-contained, whereas, you know, for my pilot ideas and the TV shows and those I have to really structure out. And, you know, frankly, I collab with, you know, those I send them, even this one I workshopped with, you know, just because, you know, what I think is funny or what could be offensive to someone else and what somebody else could think is, you know, handled like or what I think I'm handling in a sensitive way, especially for the Institute. You know, I had a lot of women read it, my mm -hmm. wife, other people, you know, friends of mine that are writers and staffed on shows and things like that, and just be like, hey, you know, I, I don't want to be offensive here. That's not the point of this movie. It's to, it's to really, you know, not necessarily to highlight this topic. You know, I'm not going to say that, you know, it's really my place to really, it's not a documentary, but to, to bring it up and, you know, say that it, you know, it does kind of bother me at some level. And especially um, it's not treated as much, right. It's, we don't really actually have enough discussion of this topic. How long did these 10.3 drafts take you? Was that over the course of a year or just yeah, what does that I roughly say, look like? I would say, a year, maybe a year and a half, because, you know, we, once I got to like draft three or four, I was like, oh, I can shoot this. You know, like it was, this was a script that I wrote to actually make, right? Most of my other work, I'll need help. I'll need, you know, finance you. They're just much bigger. You need a lot more money. Mm -hmm. This one, I was like, you know, I think I have the resources. I have some locations. I've, you know, done enough projects that I have, you know, some performers relationships with them. You know, I have this much money this is how much we need to raise. It's, it's doable. You know, we have the, the, the team with the DPs and everything. So I had all the resources kind of there and I was mm -hmm. like, I can make this movie. And then, you know, doing it over COVID kind of added some complications. We lost about 30% of our budget. Um, I, we got a little bit of a, you know, a bridge and then we decided to just go for it. So it turned out to be a really, really fun shoot, mm -hmm. you know, up in the cat skills, all the locations, you know, there's, there's, it's, it's really all kind of self-contained, the art, everything sort of fell into place. But so I was actually writing and rewriting 
as we're auditioning, as we're kind of like going to the final drafts and as we're sort of workshopping and while we're in pre-production. So that wasn't your intention, but that wasn't your intention when you first started with the idea and started cranking out the script. It wasn't necessarily your intention to produce it yourself and, and get it made that way independently. No, I think I could. I think I was pretty sure it's, it's tough to think back to the original. I mean, you know, intention, but yeah. I thought this one I could get. I could just I could make it happen. Mm -hmm. you know? And so and so let's talk about that. So once you had a draft that you were happy with, what were those next steps to actually raising the money? Um, you it sounds like you had a little bit of seed money set up. You had some of these relationships with actors and DPs. But how did you actually go about getting some additional funding for this? Yeah. You know, I mean, you've been doing this for a while too. Everybody asked this question, right? They want to know, like, there's some magic bullet, mm -hmm. like, okay, I, I do these three things and then the money comes in and I can make my movie. I mean, it's like, if I'm going to give advice to any other filmmakers, you know, and you're in the same boat as me, think of it like a business, right? I had my shorts, I had my plays, I had producers kind of help out for some of them, but there was no viable business proposition there. Right theater is you think it's hard to make money in film <laughs> theater is impossible i mean you're just it's like you know don't do it unless you you can afford to throw it away and it's sort of similar with film you know the, i went to some you know you know you have to do it as a, like a business proposition so i went to people that i know that are you know um what do you call them accredited investors or you know uh, mm -hmm. basically they have to have a certain level of income certain level of net worth, you know what I mean? Uh, some family members and my own savings. And, you know, we had to end up putting more in for bridge, you know, things fall apart and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but just, you know, being a very regimented about the business proposition is the key. So, you know, we did our pitch, we built our collateral. I had the story, you know, we had the IP for it. So it helped that I had a lot of the team worked out already. So when we went to some investors that were sort of like not in my direct circle or sort of tangentially there that we were like, here, this is what's going to happen. You have it from A to Z. We're going to take this concept. We're going to use this team. We're going to bring it to market. And then, you know, we'll let the market decide. So, you know, so far we've been able to accomplish everything that we said. Yeah. We got, we got the movie made. We got it made during COVID. We, you know, had about a year and a half of post-production just because of the cost and the, and the budget and the team that we had, you know, it just took a lot, lot longer. There was a lot of VFX and, you know, just, I wasn't really, I've done VFX shots and some other work, but this was like on a whole nother scale. So, it just took a little bit longer, a year and a half in post. And then, you know, we got our distribution, you know, we got acquired by Gravitas, which is one of our targets for distribution. And we're going to hit the market in less than a week. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think we we did what we set out to do for the investors from here on out. It's, you know, anybody's guess, but this is kind of the way I think you have to approach. Um, yeah. And so what does your pitch look like to them? Number one, did you build just like a pitch deck or like a business plan? Um, I've heard people yeah, do yeah, that stuff. And then, um, but what do you actually promise? I mean, obviously this is highly speculative. So yeah, what is your yeah. pitch to them um, just in terms of ROI and that sort of stuff? I mean, I think you can't really promise an ROI, right? This is a, this is a high risk investment. You know, you just have to be, be clear about what people are getting into. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, I don't know how, how you did it, but it's basically like, these are, you know, you have to have this kind of accredited financial standing to be able to get into this high risk category. This is the history of us, the history of our team. This is the concept, you know what I mean? And then this is where, where the money's going to go. And it's just like a business plan, you know, and just let us know if you're interested in this, you know, um, here's some comps and uh, you know, we, this is what our plan is. Obviously this is all highly theoretical and uh, you know, we don't know where it'll end up going. But um, this is what we're going to do. And, you know, this is basically it's kind of a, a trust issue. Right. I think mm -hmm. you have to be a person that is serious about getting this project done and, and delivering it to them. Mm -hmm. I think most investors, you know, I don't know what budget range, you know, your film's at. But, you know, if you get into, you know, a couple million bucks for a movie is still a couple million bucks. So, you know, if you're going to pretend that this is going to be more safe or more, you know, of a short thing than real estate, you know, you're a liar and you probably mm -hmm. should not be in this industry. But if you're going to tell people that, hey, this is, you know, a high risk investment, but we, you know, this is how we're managing to keep our costs manageable. This is the product that you're going to get. You know, at the end of the day, you have to be able to be sure the first thing is I can get this movie made for this cost, right? I've, I've had nightmares. I've been an actor in movies that were like, you know, <laughs> eight years in post or, you know, they, yeah, yeah. they ran out of money. They didn't plan it right. And it's just, mm -hmm. you know, to me that, is 
that's just horrible, right? You don't want to ever do that because the people that have actually invested, they're stuck for a decade waiting on you to get your shit together. Excuse my French. Mm-hmm. You no, know, that's just not, uh, it's just not appropriate to do to other people. So we're very yeah. clear about our abilities, uh, you know, or lack thereof really <laughs> as first time filmmakers, what we wanted to do, how we're going to approach it and what we needed for that. And I think, you know, we've been very happy that our investors have been along for the ride and trusting us, you know, and part of the process is also after you raise the money, what are you going to do? You're just going to disappear. You know, we've kept everybody really in, mm-hmm. in tune with, you know, the project where we're at the challenges we had, you know, like where I was expecting to kind of be able to wrap up post-production and hit the market and be submitting to, you know, some festivals, the end of 2020, you know, we shot this in September 20, like in the heart of, you know, COVID time, mm-hmm. I wanted to get it done, but you know, the VFX sort of hit a roadblock and, you know, we wanted to not compromise on quality. So, you know, there's three ways to make something, you know, you can make it fast, you know, mm-hmm. make it good or make it cheap. You know, you can't, you can't do all three usually. Yeah, so, yeah. Can, so we basically sacrificed the the time. We want to make it good and we want to make it for a budget. Mm-hmm. But it just took a lot longer. So we just decided to forego the kind of festival circuit and, and, you know, kind of that whole glad handing process and, and trying to, you know, do that, uh, not that I mind that. I mean, I think, you know, I love going mm-hmm. to film festivals. I support my friends when they go to film festivals all the time. But this was a movie we really wanted to just bring. We felt it was appropriate to, to bring to market. We could tip, you know, we're not embarrassed of it. We send it out for screeners, mm-hmm. you know, to, uh, you know, for reviews and everything. But that whole like one year additional going through the film festivals, getting that whole cycle together, getting that, you know, getting their stamp of approval, if you will, then going to the market. I just couldn't do that at this point. I mean, it's been, it's been consuming me, you know, for like three mm-hmm. years. So. Yeah, 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 for sure. I'm curious, um, you know, you, you've written and directed a number of these shorts, but did you get any pushback from these investors saying, well, you haven't done a feature? Like, how did you cross that bridge? Was there any pushback and what was your response? No, I didn't get any pushback. I mean, you know, I think the, the shorts my theatrical work, um, the team I brought, you know, uh, nobody really questioned me on this. Mm-hmm. Good, good. So just a general question as we wrap up the interview, what advice do you have to screenwriters that are just starting out? They want to kind of get a foothold in the industry. What is your best advice for them in the year 2022? I would love to be a guy that says he has his foothold in the industry. You know, <laughs> I, I don't want to, I don't want, I would be, it would be presumptuous of me to, to, to pretend like, you know, I have some magic bullet. I mean, I've been writing for most of my life. So the only thing I can say is just keep writing, just keep writing, man. You know, like you don't know if it's, if you're going to break through in your, you know, when you're in your teens, if we had maybe, I, you know, miraculously found some way to do that, you know, me, Gene and Joe, or if you're going to, you know, be in your fifties or sixties or, you know, like the day you die. I mean, if you really are a writer and you really want to make this, you know, you're, you're looking at this as, uh, as a passion, you're not, you know, it's not necessarily going to, to make you, rich or famous. I mean, this is something that you really want to do with your life. So just the only thing I can say is persistence and to keep going. Yeah, that's certainly sound advice. I'm curious though, where you land on um, just the do it yourself model, which is kind of the Institute. You just went and got this movie made versus, you know, the more traditional screenwriting route is, you know, sending it to agents, sending a script to producers and trying to pursue that. Have you spent time with that route and, and what, what, what makes you sort of lean into more of this sort of DIY did. filmmaker? We did. Yeah, we did. I mean, you know, we did send it out to some production companies. We did send it out to some producers, but I, you know, I, I'm not going to speak badly of anybody, but, Mm -hmm. you know, we did not feel that the offers and the teams and the kind of environment out there was really worth it. You know, it wasn't like, you know, I'm not, this may be my first feature, but, you know, this is not like, you know, I'm I'm not really just kind of star starry eyed, Mm -hmm. you know, um, (laughs) sort of overly impressed by people, you know, I've been kind of in the real world, not in entertainment for many years and dealt with, you know, uh, all kinds of industries and all kinds of situations. So mm-hmm. if the offer wasn't correct, if it didn't make me feel like somebody was valuing us, valuing the script, valuing what we brought to it and had the same vision, it really wasn't worth it. You know, I've had many other projects. I have some projects right now that I'm working on that are much, much bigger. You know, I had a story at CAA for like six months, you know, it's going to be a huge movie. I know it's going to make, you know, it's, it's a much, much bigger movie. Those things I'm going to need studio backing and I'm going to be able to, you know, have the, those routes to go through. This movie was my baby, mm-hmm. pun intended. 
And, you know, we did try to team up with some producers and we had some, you know, initial talks and kind of shopped it around a little bit. But, you know, it really, especially like COVID had started, right? So people were actually pulling back their money a little bit in the beginning. And it was like, it was very, very uncertain. A, this was our first movie. B, we're shooting it during COVID. The insurance, all that situation was very, very complicated. So I think it made other, some people sort of uneasy. So we just did what we could, you know, with people with the right risk appetites. And, you know, those are the people we're going to be going to business with in the future. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I just like to uh, wrap up the interviews by asking the guests if there's anything they've seen recently that they thought was really great that maybe screenwriters could benefit from Hulu, Netflix, HBO, anything out there that you've seen late, lately that you really like on the streamers. I mean, you know, my like the one movie that kind of sticks out that I've been sort of fanboying about for the last few years was Dune, but I wouldn't consider that necessarily like an indie or something to yeah, no, just yeah. one of my favorite books as mm-hmm. a child. You know, this is like the third time they've remade it. You know, Denis Villeneuve, I mean, he's, uh, you know, he had two hundred million dollars to make the thing. And, you know, he's uh, he's got a good eye for the story and a real passion for that story and script. So I think he did mm-hmm. a good job. It's very minimal. So I think if you're going to like go for that scale, you know, it's a good one to study. As far as like, you know, what I'm watching on on TV right now, um, I think I'm almost done with Ozark. You know, it's, it's tough to find time to really kind of I find it a little bit too on the nose. But, you know, you kind of want to keep track of what's going on. You know, you have to watch all the new shows and the big mm-hmm. streamers just to just to know what's kind of topical at this point, what the style is of these of this, the way what's getting sold, what's getting made, what the audience is really um, kind of appealing to. My wife, she watched that Inventing Anna thing. I, I couldn't really bring myself to watch that. But, uh, you know, sometimes <laughs> so that- we, we live together. We work together on this uh-huh. movie. You know, we have two kids together, sometimes a little separation. Can be yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. How can people see the Institute? Um, what is the release schedule and where is it going to be available? Uh, the release schedule, it's going to be on the 22nd. So that's um, the Tuesday. It's going to be everywhere, you know, VOD, um, cable TV, satellite TV in North America. Um, I think you can buy like physical copies if anybody still does that off mm-hmm. of like Walmart's website, you know, it's just the Institute and my name, Hamza Zaman, you know, just uh any, if you guys are into indie film and, and a good story and some fun times, uh, I think you'll enjoy it. Perfect. Perfect. And what's the best way for people to keep up with what you're doing? Um, anything you're comfortable sharing Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, I will round that stuff up for the show notes. Yeah, sure. I have a, I have a Twitter. Um, sometimes it gets used and uh, I have a, you know, our Facebook page for headless films is there and uh, for Institute movie. Um, and, you know, uh, I think those are, kind of the main areas. And, you know, I think, you know, you can probably just email us or something if you wanted, I guess that's more like for, for business stuff or just for keeping up with our projects, just, you know, uh, follow us on Facebook or, or Twitter or Instagram, you know, for headless films or the Institute movie or me, Hamza Zaman. Perfect. Perfect. Well, Hamza, I really appreciate you coming on to the show and talking with me today. Yeah. Yeah. Good luck with this film and good luck with all your future films as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully I can see some of your work as well. I, I apologize. I didn't do my, my no, no worries at all. No work. worries at all. Yeah. So yeah, we just released actually on Tubi TV, so you can waste, cool. you know, the ad, yeah, the ad supported, but if you want to yep, just yep. see it for free, yeah, you can check how it out there. It, how, how is this ad supported model? You know, we're, we're, we're kind of a little uncertain about it. We, you know, we want to go, we want to do our, you know, TVOD and then, mm-hmm. you know, obviously you'd like to get like a, a full return and, you know, and then, but not to mention international, did you get your international stuff sorted out yet? No. So we just went with indie rights, which is similar to gravitas. Um, And so we are really the ones in charge of doing the marketing, but they did, they did the TVOD first. So we're available on Amazon, you know, for the, for the two 99 or whatever. And there's a bunch of those other TVOD platforms around. And then just recently we released now on the AVOD for on Tubi TV. And I think there's some other AVODs we'll be releasing on shortly. Um, But honestly, I don't know what you're talking about or what's uh, that? It's the same movie you were you're correct. Yeah, it's called The Ride Share Killer, starring Eric Roberts. We have Tuesday night. Yeah, she's the she's the lead Tuesday night, and she's from uh, one of the Nightmare on Elm Streets. She had one of the the leads in one of the Nightmare on Elm Streets. So we have a good cast for a horror film. Um, but honestly, I can't comment in terms of whether it's working because it's literally like within the last month was when we first started releasing. Um, so did I don't you know as well. Like you, you know, you you wrote, you directed. Uh, you, did you take the same route as me? Basically, you're just pretty like, much, I'm- yeah. Pretty much. I had a lot of self-funding. We did a little Kickstarter. We did do okay. some self-funding. And then I had another producer. Um, so yeah, sort of pulled our money and, and got it done that way. 
And how many movies have you made now? This is your. Well, I I start really did start as a writer, and so yeah. I wrote and sold a bunch of scripts, more of the traditional cool. thing where I just sold them. Um, but it was very unfulfilling, to be honest with you. I would get it, you know, and it's as you know, it's extremely hard to even sell a script. Yeah. And and I was getting some, you know, some writing assignments. I would get, you know, and these things, but they're just creatively. I just found them not. I mean, these were not Limited, studio. Right? Yeah, they weren't studio level projects. So it's not like I was making a ton of money on these things. So you don't Still, get paid that well. Yeah. You, you know, it is not creatively fulfilling. And so then you get to the point, like, why am I doing this? So then I decided, well, I'm going to write and direct and produce my own stuff. So I've done two films like that. One of them is back here. It's The Pinch. Um, and that was in cool. 2017. And then we just right. did The Right Share Killer, as I said. So I've done two like that, but I've sold a bunch of scripts as well. Um, but for the most part, those have not been great experiences. I mean, nothing bad against the producers or anything like that. I'm not bad mouthing. Anything them, but get just, made? What's that? Did they get made or? Did yeah, kind of yeah. Just, I, like, I, I think I have, yes, yeah, six or seven credits Whoa, of these films that got crazy, made. Yeah. But um, one of them is Snake Out of Compton. You can check that one out. Um, <laughs> one of my first scripts was a script called Distrug. You know, some just sort of low budget, um, you know, indie films. But um, That's great, though. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Congratulations, but, man. You, I mean, you may be poo pooing it because it's not a studio film, but I think it's, you know, you, you know, you live in the dream in a way. I mean, would you work for like a TV show? Like, what's your. And yeah, you know, yeah. So no, I I don't watch a ton of the TV. I haven't written a ton of of television. Um, so it just seems like, and I know it's probably a snake mistake as we're in the golden age of TV. But um, I'm just really committed to features for some reason. Probably not the smartest business decision. But um, yeah, I've never really tried to do pursue anything with television. No, it's cool. So, I mean, if you can if you can get these movies made and you can uh, you can sell scripts. I mean, yeah. you don't necessarily have to try to reorganize yourself. You know what I mean? I just thought it was okay because coming from like a theatrical view it was like the tv is actually more similar to like the plays i wrote mm -hmm. than the movies it's it's a weird thing it was really hard to kind of get my head around but yeah just because of the way they're dialogue driven and the stories are more like kind of linear and contained and you know there i guess there's a, there's a hybrid right um but yeah Cool. I think in TV too, the writer really is king. Whereas in features, especially these indie features that I've done, I mean, you sell them the script and it's like, they don't even want bye to bye. hear from you again. Um, yeah. And that's just the way it goes. I mean, they have, you know, it's it, whoever raises the money, ultimately they have a commitment Decision. to those investors. Yeah. So the, whoever controls the money, they have to do what they feel is right for the project. And I totally get that. If I'm the one raising the money, I'm going to make those decisions. And so I understand as a writer, you have to be prepared for that, but it just, it wasn't really my jam and i might sell some more scripts you know i'm still still writing scripts that i can't produce myself so i definitely still send scripts out and stuff but um i'm just more of a do it like, yourself do you have a rep and do you like how i guess I, I, this is kind of a role reversal here as, a, as a yeah first, no this is fascinating no one's ever done this to me yeah i've done over 400 episodes of podcasts no one's really ever asked me this many questions but i'm happy no i think this will be interesting um for people to hear but i started i did have a rep back you know years ago and and honestly they never really did much for me i was always the one selling my scripts myself hmm. and um it was very typical i would get a rep and they would send it out to their five contacts they would get a bunch of notes that want me to do a bunch of rewrites, which oh, I always yeah. was a little hesitant to do. And then I would just start sending it out myself. And I went through two reps like that where they couldn't sell it. I went and sold it and they kind of got annoyed at me um, for, you know, I would because because I didn't want to do the rewrites that they suggested. I oh, said no. And then I would go and sell them. So I went through two reps that way. I've had a bunch of other reps over the years, but they never really did much for me. So huh. I just, I don't even, I truthfully, I haven't probably 10 years. I haven't even tried to even approach an agent or a manager. You just, sell, you just send your, your, your your one pagers out yourself yeah a lot of cold a lot of cold emails and that's one of the services actually i sell it selling your screenplay is the email and fax blast i have a large list a database of producers and that's really served me well i've sold a number of script option you know probably dozens of projects and actually just Amazing. flat out sold yeah and um and 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 gotten some stuff produced that way just literally cold emails i another thing back in the day in the 90s I the CAA. yeah go ahead yeah Sorry. in the 90s i i did a lot with um the trades back then hollywood reporter daily variety oh, they would have ads in the back there were producers it would be these indie low budget indie producers and i sold my first script it was a script called dish dogs um and it was just an, literally an ad in the trades where they were looking for scripts it was a bunch of low budget producers um they raised 12 million dollars to do what? six films yeah so they did oh, six okay. films they it was a different, slate. what's that? 
they put it on the slate. Cool. Yeah, exactly. So, and they just put an ad in the trades and they liked me and my buddy, Nate, we wrote this script called dish dogs and um, they went and made it for about $2 million. And I didn't think it was a very good movie. I mean, the script had problems admittedly, but they were not, the script had problems and they were not really able to fix the problem. So ultimately the movie did have problems, but, um, but you know, it was a great experience just getting that first credit and stuff. Yeah. But again, it was just, it was really just beating the bush and just sending stuff out just over and over again. So yeah, I, I think you've been giving better advice than I have, honestly, you know, me sitting in my ivory tower, just kind of like writing away, you know, that might not be the best way to get something made, but you know, like you asked, just sending out your stories, sending out your ideas, mm-hmm. you know, people are going to at least see them. They're going to say, Oh, I like that idea. I like this title. Yeah, I like yeah. this title. What I try and do with this podcast, honestly, is like, I just like hearing from other people and it's exactly what you said. You know, you can see yourself more of a farmer than an architect. I think that's so fascinating. And I think there's probably a lot of people listening to this that, you know, they consider themselves more of a farmer than an architect. And so, you know, there's, there's no one way, like anybody that starts yeah. saying you got to do this or you get, no, there's no one way. There's a million ways, you know, there's as many ways as there is people to actually succeed and get stuff made. So that's really what I true with the podcast. Just bring people on and hear your story. You have a great story. You did a bunch of shorts. And I actually think what you did, I highly like your template, I think is the template. If you want to be a filmmaker, not just a writer, but a filmmaker, I think what you're doing is a hundred percent, the template, do a bunch of shorts, get some real chops, some real practical directing and producing and writing chops on set experience, and then do shorts and then eventually start to do features. That's the tried and true. And it's not easy, as you know, it's a lot of work, but, um, you know, it just up some money yourself, you know, a lot of you times absolutely. absolutely. Done, yeah. 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 So, um, so no, I think you, what you're doing is, is fantastic. And, and this is, is said been a great interview. So it's been great to hear from you. You too, man. I hope, uh, keep in touch. I, I, I'm really interested in your, the service you're selling, you know? It's, yeah. It's yeah. Great. So yeah, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll get your email or something from the website. I don't, I don't want to drag off the, uh, yeah, yeah, no. So yeah, much. for sure. For sure. But yeah, yeah. We'll be in touch. I'll, I'll, I'll figure out where, where, what your email address is and I'll, I'll drop no you a line. No problem. So, thank you, Ashley. Thank you. So thank much you. For on. Yeah. yeah. Thank Have you, man. <laughs> we'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye. SYS is from concept to completion. Screenwriting course is now available. Just go to www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash screenwriting course. It will take you through every part of writing a screenplay, coming up with a concept, outlining, writing the opening pages, the first act, second act, third act, and then rewriting. And then there's even a module at the end on marketing your screenplay once it's polished and ready to be sent out. We're offering this course in two different versions. The first version, you get the course, plus you get three analyses from an SYS reader. You'll get one analysis on your outline, and then you'll get two analyses on your first draft of your screenplay. This is just our introductory price. You're getting three full analyses, which is actually the same price as our three pack analysis bundle. So you're essentially getting the course for free when you buy the three analyses that come with it. And to be clear, you're getting our full analysis with this package. The other version doesn't have the analysis. So you'll have to find some friends or colleagues who will do the feedback portion of the course with you. I'm letting SYS select members do this version of the course for free. So if you're a member of SYS Select, you already have access to it. You also might consider that as an option. If you join SYS Select, you will get the course as part of that membership too. A big piece of this course is accountability. Once you start the course, you'll get an email every Sunday with that week's assignment. And if you don't complete it, we'll follow up with another reminder the next week. It's easy to pause the course if you need to take some time off, but as long as you're enrolled, you'll continue to get reminders for each section until it's completed. The objective of the course is to get you through it in six months so that you have a completed, polished screenplay ready to be sent out. So if you have an idea for a screenplay and you're having a hard time getting it done, this course might be exactly what you need. If this sounds like something you'd like to learn more about, just go to www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash screenwriting course. It's all one word, all lowercase. I will, of course, link to the course in the show notes, and I will put a link to the course on the homepage up in the right-hand sidebar. On the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing Christopher Moore, who just did a really cool horror thriller film called Children of Sin. It's a sort of throwback to the great horror films of the 80s. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. That's the show. Thank you for listening.